John, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, George W. Bush and uh, the, uh, the way he used uh, what you call the prerogative power mm -hmm. in his presidency. First of all, in your, um, in your book, Crisis and Command, you discuss the, what is now, I think, familiar to most Americans, this, the historian's ranking of presidents, whether they're great, near great, or average, below average, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, how great was George W. Bush as a president? Where would, where would you put him? We, we, we sort of know where yeah. they put him, but where would you put him? Yeah, and in my book, I also didn't quite answer that question because it's still been too fresh, and I won't really know for another 15 or 20 years probably, but I would bet he's going to do better than average. I think he's mm -hmm. certainly the people who like uh, Wilentz are putting down at the bottom with James Buchanan and so on, I think, have really overreacted. I mean, I think uh, the case for him is that he's someone who is very much like a Truman, mm -hmm. that he might have been someone unprepared for foreign affairs and national security, but he did confront this big challenge. He made a lot of controversial decisions, but that in the end he set out the basic framework that's going to continue to guide our strategy ever since. Just in the same way Truman bequeathed on to Eisenhower and the people who followed him the basic strategy towards containing the Soviet Union. And I think you see that in the current administration's uh, basically fitting into the outlines mm -hmm. of what the Bush administration chose. So is your case for his near greatness or at least above average uh, rating based exclusively on his foreign policy accomplishments? Or what do you think about the domestic side? Yeah, well, this is the thing I noticed about the way presidents were ranked, or at least my argument about trying to explain why someone like Washington, FDR, Lincoln are right. at the top. And if you look at the top 10 presidents, almost all of them are uh, really defined by what they did in foreign policy and national security in the end. Like Harry Truman, one of the top 10 presidents, nobody remembers anything he did in domestic policy. Right? He, the, what was it called, the square deal or the fair, de the fair <laughs> deal, right? It just everything had to be a deal, yeah, right? It was right, not a great deal, right. but right, nobody remembers Truman's domestic policy. Eisenhower's there. Eisenhower didn't have a very significant uh, domestic policy. Most of the presidents, once you take the step back, it really depends, I think their rankings mm -hmm. depend on how well they protected the country during time of crisis. And the domestic policy issues, which we remember right away and think about and argue about yes. the most probably, tend to fade uh, over, over time. Is that true of Lincoln, though? Yeah, I think so. Like the Lincoln, you know, the, the problem with Lincoln, of course, is the Civil War the is great, really a domestic the great issue. emancipator, yes. I yeah. mean, it's, is that foreign policy <laughs> right. or is yeah, it domestic national, policy? I think of it as national security policy. Uh -huh. You know, when you think about the pure domestic issues that Lincoln dealt with, which... Uh, People like you and I, we like to pick a choose. Or most people aren't going to remember the Homestead Act, the transcontinental, right? The, the really domestic parts of the Republican Party platform, which were successfully implemented mm -hmm. once all the Democrats left. Yes, <laughs> right? yes it helped a lot. Very, it helped right, a lot. Yes. <laughs> makes it easy to pass legislation. But you know, that's not what we remember Lincoln for today either. And I and I think also Lincoln didn't think of his own presidency as defined by uh, those sort of domestic legislative achievements. Emancipation Proclamation, I think of that all as uh, foreign yes. policy and response to well, crisis. Well, Claire Booth Luce's famous formulation that every presidency is defined by a single sentence with an active verb. The <laughs> sentence, you know, the, the reductio for Lincoln's administration is he freed the slaves. Yes, freed the slaves. So what's the similar encapsulation of the Bush administration, that he kept us safe, or mm. how would you put it? Right, prevented another terrorist attack or really put, a, I mean, put us on the road is not the best active term, yeah. but you know, really uh, create the game plan for defeating Al-Qaeda. Um, just the way I think that's Truman's developed containment. Even though both, I think Truman's a good parallel. Truman left office extremely unpopular, same approval ratings almost. People forget Truman could have run for office again, mm -hmm. constitutionally, right? right. he chose not to. Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Um, there are some presidents, some great presidents, who we also recognize for what they did domestically. I want to play Ronald Reagan, who's actually mm -hmm. ranking in the polls really surprised me. I mean, he's by... He's coming up. He's number six now, yes. which actually might be a little... I mean, it might number be a six little with hot. the bullet, <laughs> right. as they used to say. In but this he, case, despite the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And he's, but you know, we recognize him for his you know, rejuvenation of the economy, right. deregulation, stopping the growth of the welfare state. But also but defeating, defeating the Soviet Union, yeah, in I, effect. Yes, yeah. and I think that's really what that justifies his placement on that list. And you look back, most of the top presidents have that kind of 
record to them, and they're not really celebrated now for what they did domestically. Mm. Well, you could also say that um, the, the greatest, I mean, Washington, Lincoln, FDR, all won wars, so they yes. were victorious in wars. Now, yes. do you say that of Bush? Did he win the war against terror, or are we still very much in the war? Well, I think the war, uh, as it started on September 11th, is coming closer to an end. I think that, uh, and some of this is because of the continuation of the uh, Obama policies, I think we really have degraded al-Qaeda's capabilities. We really have killed a lot of its top leadership. That's not our only central national security challenge these days, but that primary one mm -hmm. to prevent, I mean, if there's a the primary duty of a government, I think, is to protect us from attack <laughs> from right. abroad. And if that really is it, I think Bush did succeed. I think he got us 80 to 90% of the way there. He didn't get bin, La bin Laden in the end, which I'm yes. sure he would have loved yes. to, but that would have uh, as a symbolic measure. But in terms of stopping attacks for almost 10 years, more than 10 years now, Bush, I think, really does deserve credit for that. And we've, I think we'll appreciate that once the partisanship of the time recedes. But isn't the, isn't the Transportation Security Administration a kind of uh, mm. awful monument? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, yeah. you know, it, it's, uh, it's one of the enlargements of government yeah. for which Bush can be faulted, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and however successful it may have been, mm. uh, it doesn't seem to have stopped a terrorist attack per se. I mean, it may have mm. um, uh, intimidated uh, terrorists and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, prevented them from planning uh, uh, an attack. But that seems uh, almost a, an unfalsifiable yes. assertion, right? Yeah, it's a it's a deterrent, really. What you think, and it's and you can't prove it stopped something that never happened. Yes, is your point. But I and I and I I agree with you. Everyone hates the airport security measures, and one hopes they're not going to be a permanent feature of American life. That at some point we are going to, as we have in past wars, we're going to see that uh, the threat has receded and it no longer justifies this kind of broad and expanding government. One thing that did concern me at the time I was working in the government mm -hmm. and in the, my work since is that terrorism would lead to some kind of permanent national security state. And this is, you know, this is something that people were really, really worried about during the Cold War, too. I don't even remember, there was a famous book written right after World War II called The Garrison State. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And there were these concerns that the, uh, and, and Samuel Huntington at Harvard actually has a very strong concern along these lines that in order to actually beat the Soviets, we could not really be an open capitalist democracy. Right. It was too weak a system. And I think that turned out to be wrong. And I think that might be true of terrorism. We tend to see a lot of these very salient things like mm -hmm. the TSA, or we hear about the Patriot Act. But is the country really fundamentally different now? Have we really lost civil liberties to that great an extent? I don't think so. I think the character of the country is still, uh, still continues that liberty is still preserved. To me, actually, the greater threat has been what's been going on domestically. Mm -hmm. you know, nationalized health care, right. huge deficits, uh, takeover of various industries. But it, since it happened at the same time as a lot of the sort of the light, later years of the war on terrorism, people see that decline in liberty. And I afraid, I hope, but they don't, but I afraid they might confuse it as coming from the national security measures. Well, of course, I mean, George Bush had Medicare Part D as well, yeah. uh, the first new entitlement program since the New Deal, and one without any funding line yes. attached to it. You know, my docket at the Justice Department didn't include domestic policy, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, <but laughs> there were a number of things Good I have to confess you. I was not wasn't really uh, you know happy with in terms of domestic policy when I was there. But but uh, when we declare victory in the war on terror, we'll be dismantling the Transportation Security Administration. I would hope so, actually. And actually, I think American history, the record suggests that that happens. That during our wars, Civil War, World War One, World War Two, we had these huge mobilizations, some exercises of government power, actually, that go beyond what we're looking at today. And once the wars were over, they did tend to recede. Right mm -hmm. after the Civil War, you have the laissez-faire state, uh, the huge mobilizations of World War I, and all right. the nationalization of uh, economies all but disappear. But at, at least in the 20th century, uh, the state has shrunk after war, but never back to where it was before the That's war. I mean, there's true. always been a kind of ratchet effect after each of these wars. That's probably true. And uh, and you haven't seen that even start yet. I mean, I, I do share your uh, concern that with the war on terrorism, you haven't seen a reduction yet in government measures, 
even though the threat does seem to be receding. Now would be a time to reevaluate and ask whether we do need to continue everything, say, in the Patriot Act or all the airport security measures at the same level we have been for the last 10 years.